we're going to be talking about employment and HR challenges. It's all about the talent, moderated by the ever-excellent Laith Al-Qasim from Arabian Business Consultants for Development. Laith, over to you, and uh, as soon as Mu'tnis is up here, we can uh, continue. There he is. Go, 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 go. All right. Good luck, folks. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. We have a, uh, what I consider to be a very uh, important session um, for us. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, employment and human resources. Um, and this is a very important uh, issue. When you look at what's been happening in the region for the last two years, um, the Arab Spring, to a great extent, is the result of, of youth not having jobs. And uh, this, is, this unemployment is a failure of the job market, whether it be from the output of the universities, or companies knowing what they want, or, or, or policy interventions in terms of government, and availability of relevant training. Um, also important in ter for the human resource development and employment is the existence of sustainable companies. Uh, competitiveness and innovation are key points or key requirements for sustainable companies and sustainable economies. And for, for you to have a competitive company, you need to have competitive people. They need to have the right skill sets, they need to have the right knowledge, and they need to have the right attitude. Um, our format for today, I'm going to make an introduction to our five speakers. We're very fortunate to have five uh, really, I think, uh, very uh, special people who, who, work in the, uh, who work in the field of, of, uh, of HR and, and development. Um, I have, I'm going to pose one or two questions to get things started. And then after that, it's going to be a free-flowing discussion. Um, to my left, uh, among the five distinguished people we have, we have uh, Dr. Bashar Hawamde at my furthest left. Um, then we have Yusuf Shamoun to uh, Bashar's right, Jeffrey Avina to his right, and Mr. Uh, Mu'nis Rahman uh, to his right. So I would like to ask each, each of you two questions. I'll start with Bashar. Okay. Um, the first question is, tell us a little bit about yourself and what do you think people should know about you, something any personal. And the second thing is, what do you each consider to be the most important challenge faced by uh, employment and human resource development? You can talk about ICT if you want as a sector, or you can take it a little bit broader. Uh, Said Bashar, please. Um, first of all, thank you, Leif, for the, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Bashar Hawande. I'm the founder and CEO of Mean iTech the first um, localized HR system in the Middle East. Um, I think uh, I focus on the HR because I believe on such a topic. Uh, maybe I, I left the IT because I fell in love with, uh, with, with HR. Uh, for the past uh, 10 years, I developed a company, Mean iTech, and uh, we gain more than 1,000 clients in the uh, MENA region working in, on MENA ITEC HRMS. Uh, we have uh, really uh, some challenges in uh, doing the company and establish, establishing the company. Uh, we have many, many competitors in HR field. That's why uh, I'm, I'm here today to talk about the challenges in HR in MENA region, the, in terms of localization, technology, resources, uh, also the, the knowledge, of the people working uh, in uh, HR field. Also, I'll talk about uh, the, the technology, the cloud-based the cloud systems supporting the HR, the difference between human capital management and uh, personnel, manage, uh, personnel management, which is a, a very uh, important thing to start with. Uh, we, we'll we'll uh, talk about it in details, one by one, after uh, maybe uh, Mr. Yusuf will talk about himself and. Uh, his company also. Faddal Yusuf. Thank you, Leith, uh, for this uh, great introduction. 
Uh, my name is Yusuf Shamoun. I am the co-founder of Akhtabut. Um, I currently occupy the position of CEO. We started in 2007. Uh, something personal about me is that uh, we are all very passionate about finding an easy, efficient, and effective way of linking the right person with the right job opportunity, which is something that I think will solve most of the Middle East problems in terms of the Arab Spring, in terms of what's going on, in terms of the demographic that exists in the Arab world. And uh, going back to the challenges that you said, what are the challenges that are faced by companies in terms of recruitment and, and so on? I think that finding the right person, hiring the right people, and matching the right person with the right job is by far the biggest challenge that new companies are facing. Uh, companies that want to grow or companies that are established and continue to grow. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jeffrey Avina. I'm the Director for Corporate Social Responsibility Citizenship at Microsoft for the Middle East and Africa. Covered 79 countries. Before that, I was a UN ambassador and also the UN Deputy Director for Africa. So a lot of experience in development, which I find very interesting. Uh, moving to the private sector for me has been an interesting challenge because in essence, you get right to, the cr right to the crux of the matter in terms of the challenges that development is and learn to realize that frankly, the answers are in the private sector. Uh, if you look at the challenges, I, I see three things. Number one, the way our moderator has, has prefaced this, one of the principal causes of the Arab Spring one of the two, I think, is the fact that youth were looking for jobs. Well, that's a problem because youth are still looking for jobs, right? So nothing's changed. And one thing I remember from my first uh, college sociology class was a concept called the J-curve of revolutionary expectations, which means right after something starts going good, if something doesn't get better, it can go really bad. So it's important for us to recognize that you have a massively empowered youth population. I think yesterday was mentioned 60 million. Uh, who have aspirations and want to find a place to use them and land them. Uh, with regard to what's the challenge for the ICT industry, I have some more bad news because I think that actually there isn't a challenge for the ICT industry per se. The ICT industry is mobile, and it was mentioned actually in the earlier keynote. The fact is they will find labor wherever they can find labor. They'll move or they'll bring them in. I know in the U.S. currently there's new discussions about how to facilitate the immigration of talented people from throughout the world for U.S. companies. And if that fails, the U.S. companies and other companies will simply move to where those labor uh, forces are. The challenge for labor in our region is to make sure that people in our region actually have the capacity, the training, which would actually attract investment or would be able to suit the needs of the growing and changing market. This is the challenge we face. And so part of the answer, I think, is that we have to meet that new, fresh energy which has come out of the Arab Spring with a capacity to provide avenues and opportunities. And for me, this is about taking that inspiration but directing it towards actual possibility. And this means teaching soft skills. We were talking earlier about simply writing a CV or simply doing an interview, but also teaching hard skills and helping uh, youth understand and perhaps even help youth move forward and changing the way the market and the economy works. And I think part of that is really taking advantage of what they do already, which is dream which is use a platform and also 2G enable capacity and let that evolve into new opportunities. And I'll close by saying one of the big investments that Microsoft will be making, and actually was just announced uh, last month, is an investment in what we're calling the For Africa Initiative, which is continent-wide, but which will cross over into this region as well, which is about innovation, investment in innovation. It's about investment in low-cost devices, and it's an investment in world-class skills. 40 million a year for five years, not tied to any revenue expectation returns. It's more of a big bet, recognizing that we believe that some of the best apps and some of the best minds are actually in this region and need to be inspired. So this is where we stand. Big challenge to make this region successful, to reach the aspiration level that was, that was put really on the line with the Arab Spring, with the, with the efforts that were made by youth, and not just by youth, by the way, throughout this region. Thank you, Jeffrey. Monis, please. Monis Rahman, um, I started my career in the U.S. in the Valley. Uh, something a bit personal about me, I, um, I like to do things that people say are impossible. It's a challenge for me. I moved back to Lahore in Pakistan in 2003, and I'm sure the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear Pakistan is uh, entrepreneurship, right? Uh, we started our job site at a time when people thought that um, it was very difficult for employers to move on to the internet, and that proved to be a fallacy. 
Now, one of the things that we're, we're finding now, we've grown tremendously in Pakistan. Um, we get over uh, 100 applications a minute. That's more than one per second. We have a massive amount of data, more than 100 jobs are posted a day. So we're at a unique vantage point in uh, seeing the alignment between what the labor market is producing and what employers want. And one of the things that Pakistan has in common with the MENA region is the population is very young. And that poses a number of problems. So I think the biggest challenges um, are related to this population bulge. It can be a tremendous asset for the region or it can be a huge liability. It can be a time bomb if we aren't prepared to handle it correctly. And among the issues is uh, we're seeing a massive misalignment between what the academic institutions are producing and what companies need and are, uh, are trying to get education institutions to produce. And there's a massive time lag between when you can close that feedback loop. By the time the educational institutions realize a certain skill set is in demand, it's too late. Four years already go by before the person graduates. A classic example is if you look how quickly Android has evolved. Tremendous demand for Android programmers. It's one of the fastest growing OSs now. Java became a skill set that a lot of people wrote off earlier on, and now it's in resurgence. But by the time that feedback loop hits the academic institutions and the youth are enabled with that skill set, it's going to be too late and we're going to import talent. Uh, the other thing is just by the fact that a lot of the youth is inexperienced. That's the nature of youth. And companies are demanding experienced resources. So there's a natural evolution that needs to take place while our youth get employed by industry, gain the experience, and are be able to manage the companies that they're employed in. So that's something that I think employers have to have a lot of patience with. They have to hire, and they need to train. Thank you. Um, earlier, I was talking with our, our speakers, our panelists, and, and I really I want to throw two questions out, and, and, and anyone can, can address one or more of them. The first one is, do companies really know what they want? Okay. And, and the second question I have is, do you know how companies can predict what they need? Okay. Because if you're building for the future, you want to make sure that the graduates that come out of schools are what you need in five years' time, not what you needed four years ago. I mean, I think uh, out of experience, uh, and during the past uh, 10 years, I, I don't think uh, most of the companies in, in MENA region are ready to implement HR system. I ran uh, more than 100 uh, demonstrations for HR presentations uh, in MENA region. The, the worry is about payroll, personnel management, time attendance, deductions, etc. No one uh, is worried about the real HR functionality, like uh, to have a structured job description, required competences for the job, uh, incentive programs, career path planning, succession planning. Nobody care about the talent management. Uh, few companies uh, in the mega size, they, they, they really uh, worry about uh, such uh, functionality and uh, practices. But I think um, most of the companies, the small ones, maybe 99% uh, in Jordan are, are small companies, they are only uh, worry about doing the payroll on time, doing the calculations, etc. But they are not ready to implement uh, HR systems. They don't have job descriptions competences, they don't have uh, any plans for retention. I think uh, this is a major issue. And uh, out of our experience, this is part of the knowledge transfer that we should do and uh, we should uh, teach uh, our students in the schools and uh, universities to learn more about HR, major functionality, and to focus on such uh, practices and to maybe to copy the international standard with local touch. This is, I believe, I believe in this uh, approach uh, that uh, enhance and enrich the, the knowledge of the people in, in, in our country. Thank you, Bashar. Anybody else want to take a... Um, I want to talk about whether or not companies know what they want and whether or not companies can predict the future in terms of their future needs when it comes to the ICT sector specifically. Um, now, we all know that the ICT sector is constantly evolving. And going back to what Mu'nis said, uh, the academic institution's alignment with what's required in the job market sometimes, uh, or actually sometimes doesn't match at all. Now, uh, you, you know the uh, undergrad degree is four years. 
So it is normal for an undergrad to learn something the first year, and then when he graduates four years later, what he learned the first year is more or less obsolete and he needs to learn something new. So even if the alignment exists with those academic institutions, then sometimes you know, it sort of defeats the purpose when this person graduates. I think that instead of uh, aligning your, yourself with what the market needs is very important, but I think what's more important is teaching uh, or, or having them learn how to learn, right? Because they're gonna have to constantly learn new things and whenever these new things emerge, they need to have the ability to go and look for that information and not wait for the information to come to them, to constantly learn how the ICT sector is evolving because it's, it's really different than the, the HR sector, for example. So you can, you can, for example, order a book from Amazon, an HR book, and it can be written in 2008 and it can still be a good, a good read. You can just, you know, not much has changed since 2008. 2012, but if you're looking at an ICT article or an ICT piece of information, then it has to be recent and it has to be up to date and otherwise whatever you're reading, whatever information you're absorbing isn't useful, as is, isn't something that you can use practically in the real world. So I think in a nutshell what I'm trying to say is that learning to learn is by far more important than getting the information that, that you're basically getting while you're an undergrad and while you're at, uh, at uh, university. Just a Maybe to add on to that, I think that this is one of the problems we have in our educational systems in many parts of the world, certainly here. Rote learning does not teach people to think. And what we're really looking for, and I think what a company's looking for, no matter what the job specification says, I would think a smart company is actually looking for that person in the next job up. So they're really looking for people who can think and who can adapt and who can change. And what we're talking about really is lifelong learning. How creative and how directed are people to solve problems which are going to be arising, whether it's a small micro company or it's a more mature company? And this is part of the challenge. This is what we have to kind of deal with. I was mentioning to Leith uh, that I was at a conference in, in Asia not too long ago, and I met a guy from Korea who was from the, actually from the Ministry of Lifelong Learning. The, the fact that the government even had the notion of lifelong learning demonstrates kind of a uh, futuristic ver uh, vision, which I thought was very important. For many of us, we graduate, we think we're done learning. But really, that's just a demonstration that you got a degree. It's not much more than that unless you continue to upgrade, especially, as been said, you know, by use of in the IT sector, because this is a sector which is changing every day. So that is a significant requirement for people. Uh, to just add on, I, I agree with what everybody has saying. With Yusuf, especially, uh, learning to learn, I think that's, that's a great point. Um, you know, what, what we've seen is that employers have a very traditional view of what they think they want. Um, and what ends up happening is you put people in a box that have certain skill sets. You say, yes, MBA, yes, three years of experience. And once you're in the box, you say, this person qualifies, and then, then you choose the best. But what ends up happening is you lose a lot of the gems because of this very stringent criteria. And you're conditioning the labor force to basically acquire those very specific skills. We kill creativity. And when you cre kill that creative process, the whole evolution of the company, the growth, the out-of-the-box innovation, it gets killed. So we end up with a workforce filled with robots who are executing, but they're not innovating. And that's something that we have to overcome. Uh, uh, what you said, Monis, is very interesting because robots is what they wanted in the Industrial Revolution. We have to sort of grow out of that into, into what we have now. But if I just may comment on, on what I've heard, particularly from what uh, Bashar said, it doesn't seem that we have a problem with HR, it seems that we have a problem with management in general, that they do not necessarily recognize that, uh, that human resources are an input to production and that the better quality of human resource that you have, the better that the company gets. So I'm going to ask uh, this question. Um, taking into consideration what was just said now, what do you think the implications are for education or training, lifelong, on the job or whatever, either at a university or at a policy level or, at w or within, uh, within companies? Um, uh, maybe I'll jump in really quickly because I think we're going to get very pragmatic fast, sure, which is okay. useful. Lifelong learning is not for incoming employees. Lifelong learning is for all of us. And just listening to the comments from my colleague here from Pakistan, the fact of the matter is, if management is thinking like that, that means they're not learning. 
If they're not learning, then what can you expect out of your youth except to make them just like you? But just like you is no longer good enough for what's coming up next in the market. And next in the market is tomorrow. Everything we've seen here is about how things have changed so fast. So how do you provide an aspirational environment? And that does start with youth, but also it starts in the company. Going back to youth and going back to methods of teaching. Uh, obviously, educational institutions will change slowly. You can't expect a complete change, but they, they, they have to change. But in the interim, I think part of this overlay, which has been mentioned uh, in different comments, is about how you add on additionality and skill sourcing. You may have to do certain courses in school, but what about helping youth access other courses? One thing that, that Microsoft's been driving with different partners, Silitech, which is the Qatar Foundation, different partners in the regions, is an upskilling portal. It has 400 courses on it, all free. It has a mentoring system, which is really critical because it's not just about getting information, but about talking to people like you. If I was a youth and I could talk to anyone in this room about the specialty area that you have and why that might be relevant for me in Jordan or in Tunisia or in another country, this is useful. And it also, by the way, for those of you who are very strong on the 2G area, has a 2G band uh, linkage. So the, the, the learning can be done 2G. It has a job search function, which is uh, web-based, 3G and 2G. So part of the issue for me is to recognize that we cannot expect school institutions to change at the rate that will be necessary. The private sector input is to actually provide an additionality. Added courses, added training, soft skills, hard skills, certification, which can sit side by side with universities, but help make that segue, which is currently lacking between formal institutions and what the job market requires. Well, you know, I think the implications are, um, are very dire. Uh, we need to reinvent the way we're educating our youth. Uh, and I think that's, that's absolutely critical right now. The feedback loop between skill set creation and what's being taught at institutes need to be short-circuited dramatically. I remember we were trying to find an Android programmer and we found a CV that said 15 years of Android programming experience. We're really impressed until we realized Android hasn't been around for 15 years. <laughs> but the point of the matter is, you know, these new skills are evolving so rapidly. And until we can shortcut that feedback, as I spoke about earlier, uh, we're going to have this massive gap. Uh, there are various tiers of the skill set model as well. Some you have vocational skills that need to be taught. Uh, some are higher skills like MBAs as an example. But until we invest a lot of money and a lot of resources on education, we're not going to be able to employ uh, this huge asset that we have. Sorry. I think we've heard enough from our panelists. I want to, uh, there you go. Hosni is always at the forefront. Let's open it up for questions. Um, also, I would like to tell the, uh, the panelists if they also would like to add anything randomly, please do. Uh, Hosni. Uh. And the question, uh, I, I think that the first part was heard. The second part is like, Yusuf, you are leading one of the important portals for recruitment in the region. You do understand that there is a big challenge between mapping the candidates and what they do have as well as with, with the employers. Where is the link to be able to talk to educational institutions to make them understand, learn, learn how to learn, uh, that, that what's needed to be sure that we are having the next generation of employment so that they do have what we need as, as, as an industry? And as well as that, can Bashar also can tackle that from the systems. How we can be sure that we are connecting the employer with the employees and with the educational system to be sure that we are having something that is relevant to this region. Thank you. Maybe just to, uh, to start, um, first of all, just coming back to a comment that was made here, we need a lot of money to be invested in changing education. I was thinking in my mind, or maybe we don't need any money at all. Maybe we just let the education system be what it is and we really help access the free information which is available online and get that information to those going through systems. Of course we need to change the education system, but if you wait for a government process to make that happen, it is a long-term issue when actually the market changes so fast. 
And to change or provide new information and access, whether it's 2G, 3G, or web-based, is not that hard. It's there. We can do it. Actually, we are doing it already. We started in the Arab Spring in Egypt. We're now launching it in Tunisia in partnership with Tunisiana, uh, one of the telcos there. Coming to this point, uh, Husni, about uh, the way that companies recruit, maybe we need to deconstruct it. I mean, I'm thinking about the region right now. I'm sure Microsoft and Redmond has that certain very formatic way, formulaic, and I'm sure all the other companies do too. But maybe instead of, qual uh, of, of qualifications, they should be looking at qualities of the people. What are they actually good at? And if you're only going through an HR review process, then they're probably not talking to the right people first. I mean, if you're the hirer, would you really have this, would you want the person to go through three people in the HR before it gets to you? You're going to have that instinctive sense of whether this person might have what I'm looking for. Uh, this is a problem, of course, of big companies, but I think that we need to probably inverse the structure in which uh, recruitment takes place. For small companies, uh, which is the majority of companies here, they actually have that capacity to see and know what they need. I think uh, the comments that were made earlier was about the fact that what we really need is to make sure they have the knowledge to be guided about what it means to hire. What does it mean to actually have someone in your company, your second or your fifth employee? What are the implications? How do you then create a learning environment? This is a whole process of learning. By the way, some of this can also be done online. And the last thing that I wanted to throw out here was that, and we're driving this now, I think every student, whether or not they ever will be an entrepreneur, should be trained in what it takes to be an entrepreneur. You know, we have a course which we've done with an NGO. Uh, it's called Build Your Own Business, French, Arabic, English, free. Other, other IT companies have these as well. We just came out with ours now, so it's top of line. Uh, and basically, we're trying to drive this into all schools. And we want to drive it into access to all youth. Because the point is, it doesn't mean you have to become a Bill Gates. If you can run your own bakery, or you can run your own shoeshine business, whatever it might be, which is better than what you were, that already is aspirational. Husna, your story was a perfect example, frankly, from yesterday. So I think that we have to add on elements. You're not going to be able to knock on the door of a principal. I know all of us IT comes and tried. Here's a bunch of IT. Here's new curricula, et cetera. But the fact of the matter is, sometimes we go back and visit those schools. The computers are locked away in a special place, and they don't let anyone use it because they don't understand them. You can't change that, but you can actually use what youth already have, a telephone, or in some place, access to computer labs or computer centers and use those as your vectors to build out and strengthen the efforts that are being made by my colleagues here. I'll add something here regarding the, the hiring. Is it an, uh, it is an uh, internal process or decision inside the organization to pay for competency or to uh, uh, wage for edge? So I think uh, in our um, IT business, we should focus on competences be because we are doing job evaluations based on competences and uh, the knowledge itself, not for the certificates and the grades. Uh, in, the, in the university, you can look at the certificate and the grades, and you can, uh, you can hire ba based on the grades and certificates. In the IT, most of the IT uh, business depend on um, uh, talented uh, people, and uh, they are uh, really focusing on certain uh, job profiles and competences, and I think we should pay for competency, not for uh, certificates. Um, let me just talk about learning to learn uh, with regards to Husni's question. So, and let me also um, uh, answer the question with an example, a practical example um, uh, about the university here in Jordan. We have the German Jordanian University or the German Jordan University, uh, one of the uh, leading universities here in Jordan. And what they do is they have a one year mandatory internship for students in Germany, right? And um, uh, so if you're an engineer at GJU and you go for a year internship to Germany, and you know, Germany is, is one of the leading industrial countries in the world. So as an engineer, you're not only learning, but you're learning from the best people in the world. Now, why don't we have something like this, for example, for IT people, where they can really go to the top of the pyramid and, and learn? for a year and have that learning period mandatory, even if it means, okay, I'll graduate a year later, but maybe I know what I want, maybe I know what it means to enter the job market, maybe I know some of the differences between academia and real work experience. So that's just one example uh, um, uh, here that, that actually is happening in Jordan. Uh, with regards to matching people to jobs, I think that 
the, the ICT sector in Jordan particularly has amazing talent. People in Jordan are very, very talented and they're extremely smart and they are very technically savvy. But where does this sort of match, sort of the bottleneck happen? We feel that sometimes they don't have the best communication skills, right? Communication skills include writing a CV. So if you're a fresh graduate, why don't you very effectively or efficiently learn how to write a CV? We see a lot of sort of mistakes in CVs that don't give the right first impression of this candidate to the, to the employer. Because you might be a great candidate, but as an employer, the first impression I get of you is basically your CV, how you write your CV, how brief it is. And if it has a bunch of spelling and grammar mistakes, then this really doesn't send the right message at all to the employer. One step after that, if you have a great CV, the next step is the interview process. And I think, you know, the, the CV writing process and the interview process is critical and crucial when it comes to, you know, matching people with the right job. It gives the employer a better idea of whether or not I want to hire this person, as well as, you know, gives the, the job seeker a better chance of landing the job that is more suitable for him or her. So now we all know that finding a job is difficult, but finding the right job is even more difficult. So if I, my skills are very properly honed towards, you know, preparing for an interview, knowing what questions to ask, knowing what sort of research to do, knowing what the company does, reading the job description, preparing myself, this significantly increases my chances of at least making a good impression and getting an offer. And once you have multiple offers as a job seeker, then you have options. And it's always you know, better to have, to have options when it comes to your job. And the first job that you land is important, is important for you know, the rest of your life because it, in a sense, maps your career. So you're, you're always gonna have this job on your CV unless you work for two months here and then two months there and then you keep job hopping here and there and then you just decide I don't wanna include this and I wanna include that. But ultimately, if you work at a job for several years, then you have to at least do proper research and make sure that your CV is a direct reflection of your skills and of your personality as well. Thank you. More Mr. Diaz. So, so just real quick, um, I think the matching problem is really a data problem when you really boil it down. Uh, you'll be surprised how difficult it is to match skill sets between what employers want and what is written on a CV or through an application because there are hundreds and thousands and millions of fragmented words that describe skills. For example, we found that there are about 130 different ways to spell the programming language PHP. Mm -hmm. So uh, huge, huge issues there. So we've started skill ontologies where we're mapping functional areas by quantifiable skills so that both the employer and the job seekers are speaking the same language. Now what this allows you to do is from a filtering perspective, you can quickly hone down on the people that are relevant. We can also give clues back to the job seekers saying you have these three skills but the job market, these jobs you're applying for needs these four additional skills that are related to these three skills. And here's where you can go to acquire them. So this is really, really important feedback. Um, I wanna share a quick story with you. You were asking why uh, job sites and job boards aren't rolling feedback back to the academic institutions to improve the curriculum. We did a massive exercise of analyzing about 28 million job applications, functional areas, job titles, people who applied skill sets. And the goal of the study was to identify a mismatch between supply of labor and a demand for labor. And we were very successful in doing that. So we invited vice chancellors from 88 academic institutions. Mm -hmm. We presented the entire brief. We found out that accounting was a skill that was in oversupply and the wages were very low. And if somebody's looking for bright career prospects, accounting probably isn't the best area to enter into. We gave a report this thick in the hopes that it would get rolled back. And uh, there wasn't much movement on it from the academic institutions. And I think we need to continue driving it. So what we've done is made this data available real time on our site in the hopes that we'll find a consumer in an academic institution that will actually roll it in. That's very interesting. Any other questions? Please, here and then there. Uh, microphone horn, Lord Samakto. Hello, 
Um, my question is, I've been in the corporate world for a long time, like many of you, and basically uh, what I feel is that we're all, as people, impressionable. And CVs are done to, impression, to, to impress us to a large degree, which I'm completely against it. So what I've seen throughout is basically all of the people, and I did it myself, so I'm guilty in charge, in terms of, you know, you go through the CVs if you're hiring someone, and you go for, okay, best school, best company, whatever, whatever, you know, sort of. And I, I feel now that this is just as an insurance policy for all of us, so we take it because we're not ready to, like, take the risk and really look for the right person for, or the right job. So I just want to know, you know, we, I think we need to change this. So it's very, very important because uh, throughout my life I've met people that don't have, you know, the, they've never been to their, you know, the Ivy League school or they've never, you know, really worked with multinationals and everything, but they were really the best people for the job. So uh, how can we change, you know, work on changing the mentality of especially the big corporates to start thinking about this in terms of, you know, as opposed to just CV and insurance policy, like hiring consultants all the time. <laughs> so I guess I'm the only big corporate up here, which is kind of nice. I'll start answering that, but I think I'm gonna get better answers from some of my colleagues here. But just to start, I think what's happening now is big corporates are realizing that, and some of the presentations in the last two days have showed this, the market, the, 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 the center of the market's shifting. It's shifting to the emerging world, right? The emerging economies will drive the future. And as comments here were said, I mean, the best talent is actually here for localized solutions and for global solutions. This for Africa investment I mentioned is Microsoft's way of saying, we think that the best answers for what the world is going to need is going to come out from this region in the coming years. So it's not really Redmond-based anymore. And I want to come back to the point I made to Husni. I mean, I think it's for looking for the qualities of the people, not their qualifications, which means a direct engagement by persons like you and having also the courage to say, look, I am Jordanian. I want to make sure I'm hiring someone who's here who needs that same chance that perhaps I got when I was young. And, and I'm, I'm going to keep coming back to this thing about the Arab Spring and the 60 million unemployed youth. You know, we need to invest in our people here. Even if there was someone else who you could get from somewhere else who might be better, I think we need to invest in helping people feel there is a hope. And just to understand more broadly, as I speak with donors, whether it's the World Bank, uh, IMF, USAID, they all believe that the IT segment is going to drive employment. <coughs> but it's not going to drive employment unless you, the people who are here, get very creative about how you think about employing locally. There's great opportunity right now, but the fact of the matter is, it's not just about what a corporate can do. We can hire 100 here or 200 there, as could perhaps you. I'm not sure your business, but that's not the answer. How do we, I mean, for a Microsoft, Microsoft would be more interested in who is developing that is interested in the platform, as would any large organization. And so developing a local ecosphere of people who are familiar with and would use that platform, which means people straight out of school. I just came from judging uh, New York University Abu Dhabi hackathon. The teams are from all over this region, 16 teams, 16 amazing apps. Six of them are already commercially viable, frankly speaking. Six of the teams already connected to Microsoft people because I thought this is something that we could actually use. So, I mean, the creativity is actually there. The linkage to the company is the interesting challenge, which is why I always say, let's train them as entrepreneurs in addition. Because the fact of the matter is, if they apply to your company and my company and don't get a job, it doesn't mean they fail. They may need another route, you know, the access to, to capital, the access to mentoring. If you don't hire me, would you still mentor me? for example, and that's something which most companies do not think about. They don't make that longer term investment. They leave it to the HR department, you know, dear so-and-so, sorry you didn't get hired, end of story. But really, it's looking at youth and people in a different way. Let's look at them in that lifelong trajectory process. And I think that even ourselves, we're doing this as Microsoft, we are driving the, this employment portal that I mentioned earlier. This is a made in MIA invention. The build your own business curriculum that I mentioned earlier, this is a made in me invention. And you know what's happening? It's spreading across the world. But the ideas didn't come from me, Jeffrey, as an American. It came from my Egyptian team, from my Tunisian team, all responding to the Arab Spring. So I want, we will invert this pyramid, but it's only going to be inverted if you simply continue to invest locally and drive opportunity for local youth. Thank you. Anybody else like to address okay. that? 
Um, I think your question was a great one, actually. You know, human beings are very complex in terms of resources in an organization. Uh, we're very unpredictable. We're not like any other resource that's used by an organization. The same person will not react the same way every time you ask them the same question or pose the same task. It's based on our moods. It's based on our environment, our incentivization. So it's very complex to judge people. And I've been speaking about algorithms to match and data, but the reality is there's a much more social element in here, which you can't get off of a CV, which you can't get off of skills and all the keywords that you're matching. And this is a social element. So I think we need to evolve in terms of employers uh, how we evaluate people from a social perspective. And there are lots of tools we're looking at to do that. But I think it comes down in the end to human intuition. I don't think we're going to find any kind of a computer that can beat the intuition we have after we meet somebody. Thank you. There was a question over here, please. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maria Majid Bantunia. I'm an IT director from United Arab Emirates. We um, can't hear you. At least I can't hear you. If you could move the microphone okay. closer. Um, my name is Maria Majid Bantunia. I'm from the United Arab Emirates, and I'm an IT director. I'm here to share some thoughts of what I have le uh, listened uh, today, and I have something also to share with you so you can just step out with me. So what I have uh, heard from you, sir, uh, actually, I, I didn't come for the first session, so I don't know the name, but uh, you said that we can, uh, the graduate, they can depend on the online information uh, beside their uh, certificates, but just to share with you, in business in reality, would you accept someone and hire them just based on the information they got on the online? Because usually we, fr the fresh graduate, we don't expect them to be experienced, but at least we will take them from their, uh, what they have studied in the university and match them to the jobs we have in the, ops in the uh, organization. The second thing is, um, uh, um, what I want to share with you is that um, do you think that creating a hub between post-graduating to job hiring to just put these fresh graduates into some kind of training or just to make them or enable them to be ready for the workforce at, the, um, at least in the IT sector? just to make them sure that they are talented in certain areas and you as a businesses are part of this hub so you can know which this uh, fresh graduate you can hire. Thank you. Let me answer you regarding the hub. Uh, I think we, we already have uh, some organizations in the uh, MENA region and uh, in UAE like in Jazz and uh, WAMDA there is a hub and a bridge between the private sector and the public sector, uh, and they um, use the, inter uh, the benefit of internet penetration in the uh, MENA region to uh, really educate uh, students on uh, business skills uh, uh, courses, and um, I think the hub is already exists, but uh, uh, in Jordan and in some areas in the, in the, in the countries, I think we have fragmented uh, recipes. We have to put a committee, maybe uh, to talk together. This is a communication issue, not uh, because we have good students, we have good uh, universities, we have private sector, very strong private sector, we have very strong telecom to, to give the internet. I think the issue is to have an integration between all parties to produce uh, non-duplicated uh, effort for uh, training and educate the uh, students. To, to add to that, I was thinking, you know, there are cases where government, public policy, political will can be useful, especially if they can afford it. I'm thinking of a program that we're doing in Saudi, which is called ITKAN, which is a program where the government's committed to place 30,000 youth, principally women actually, in jobs in the petroleum and the financial services sector. Microsoft's contribution is to do certification training, free of charge, uh, and the government's commitment is to actually pay for that first year of, of, of training and employment. I love the idea of taking students out of the university context and having them have that chance to work and then go back because they're the same ones who are going to put the pressure back on their teachers to make sure they're learning relevant skills. So it kind of allows this, this, this feed which is coming from the students, which is different from the, the case uh, that we, we just heard about in Pakistan where they actually came up with the information, gave it back to the academics themselves who may not have changed. 
but the students can actually drive change in the universities and help make that process take place. I, I see these, these processes of, of internships and trainings growing throughout the region. I can mention probably four or five countries where I know this is happening, sometimes paid for by government, sometimes paid for by private sector contribution, uh, sometimes paid for by international donors, whether it's the World Bank or USAID or, or, or others. Uh, so I think what we need is much more coordination, as was just said, because the fact of the matter is, even if you think about entrepreneurship three years ago, how much coordination was there around entrepreneurship? Not very much. But right now, everyone's talking entrepreneurship, 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 everyone's getting together, which is really great, except you and I know that only one in 10 persons is gonna be an entrepreneur. And most of them are gonna be small entrepreneurs, and that's not gonna be the answer to the 60 million unemployed people, right? Nor is employability the answer. We need new answers, which is helping people do local job creation, landing people in good jobs, helping promote that entrepreneurship cycle where people can actually start hiring others, and also thinking even more broadly about getting people experience, maybe not jobs. I'm thinking about a program that exists in, in, uh, in, uh, in Gaza where they can't land people jobs, but they're landing them with tasks. People are getting work uh, outsourced uh, through webs from different companies to do specific things for them. And they're getting paid and they're getting experience for their CVs, which they would not be able to land locally. So I think we can do a lot, but I think, uh, I think there has to be a very dedicated push uh, from people like yourselves, from large companies, from small companies, and from governments to say, we will simply do something about this. And I keep coming back to it, 60 million people, J-curve of revolution expectations. There's been a number of revolutions in this region, all with the best aspirations, great youth, talented, unskilled, unexperienced, but really, our future. So what can we do to give them that opportunity? And, and you know, to, to just add on to that, I think uh, internships and on-the-job training are extremely important, but uh, from an employer perspective, it's often hard to take the risk of training somebody who's fresh and there's no experience, you've got pressures from a deadline, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we're not able to create that ecosystem of internships, which are very, very important to train our youth. One program that uh, we ran with a national ICT R&D fund uh, on the ground in Pakistan, the R&D fund provided stipends for internships for all IT companies. All of a sudden, IT companies saw this as a way of getting free resources and labor, so they started hiring interns who otherwise they considered unemployable. The results were fantastic. I was very skeptical, but what happened after three months of this, a good percentage of these interns became very productive, acquiring very, very valuable skills. And the challenge then became for those employers to retain those resources because they would leave and get job offers at astronomical rates. So I think that's a fantastic investment of funds. And it just proves that internships are very, very effective. And if we can invest in them, I think it's going to help us all grow. OK, I'm going to, sorry. I'm supposed to end, but uh, please. Uh, microphone here. Sorry? Uh, this is Sandra Hamade. Uh, I will sorry. add something on the... Uh, oh, there you are, sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry. But very, uh, very briefly, please, because we yeah, have to wrap yeah. up. In, in a very short uh, comment, I have to, uh, based on my experience uh, as a recruitment consultant and uh, as a uh, managerial uh, positions here. I've held certain managerial positions in startup companies in Jordan. Uh, first of all, I've noticed something in Jordan, uh, the secondary degree, Tawjihi. Uh, this is a great issue because uh, based on the grade, uh, the person or your kid will uh, determine their future. Mm -hmm. um, and this is not fair because mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, people um, have their skills and talent and uh, their uh, what they like is not what they study in university and this affects them in uh, the business field uh, so i've had uh, people come and uh, put their cv on their cvs i know i've noticed uh, uh, average 62. Uh, this is something that the grade of the university is mentioned on the CV. And this sometimes uh, costs them staying unemployed for several years. Um, what I noticed, I, uh, for this case in specific, I looked at the skills of this person. And the skills 
they match my need as an employer. So I've recruited this person based on the skills and not on the degree, uh, on the uh, average uh, in the university. Uh, this, is should, this should be taken into consideration from the government sector. You, you don't put, you don't allocate people in universities on certain degrees based on their average. This is not fair and this is major in uh, deciding uh, the human uh, resource that you, you're be putting in the field, in the business field. This is one. Second, uh, on the private sorry, sector. Sorry, we have to wrap up. If you up, can please, please Lenovi. Uh, uh, sorry, we have to wrap up. Sorry to cut you off. We're going to have to cut it off. I'm very sorry. Okay, it's okay. Um, I just want to address, address this. Um, it is up to the companies to decide how they want to hire. Yani, uh, they are not, they are not, um, yani to hire somebody that has a 92 tawjihi. They can hire a 62 tawjihi if they believe that person possesses the skills that they have. The problem is you have to break out of that, uh, of that uh, traditional uh, way of thinking. Anyway, um, I want to thank our panelists. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, a, a round of applause for them, please. Um, if, if we did not get around to your questions, I would highly recommend that you uh, talk to them now. Thank you very much. Can I just say that uh, for the woman who just hired someone with a rating of 62, thank you for doing that. It demonstrated that you're going for quality instead of qualifications. And I think this is what we need to be doing. And maybe the lesson is that we need to be advising students not to put that on their, on their papers. So congratulations for making a good intuitive decision. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, thank you, Leif, for moderating the session. Uh, thank you for all your questions.